Hello and welcome to today's webinar in the Gray Learning webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite topics related to layer masking in Photoshop. I am Tim Gray. Many of you know me through the Gray Learning website. Some of you maybe are new. I want to give a quick thank you to Tamron for sponsoring this webinar. And in fact, the entire series of Gray Learning webinars this year. And so we'll have some more information about them a little bit later. Be sure to check your email. We will send a link. It's one of the most common questions for the webinars is will it be recorded? And yes, indeed, it is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email with a link to that recording so that you can watch it as many times as you'd like. We do encourage you to watch it over and over again. So big thanks to Tamron for sponsoring the presentation. This week I need to also send a shout out to my cellular provider because the internet went down and we're now using a cellular data connection, but always good to have a backup plan, isn't it? We learned that in photography and uh, it's certainly true with technology in general. Let's go ahead and dive in though. We're going to be talking about what is often regarded as a rather complex subject in Photoshop. Targeted adjustments and creating composite images and layer masks. And today I just want to focus a little bit narrow on some of the techniques for essentially improving the quality of your layer masks. So we'll dive into an image first that relates not exactly to layer masking, but in a way it does, of course. And that is the notion of feathering a selection. This is a topic, those of you that have been following me for a while or maybe have watched the, the lessons in the video courses on grade learning related to selections and layer masks already know I do not feather selections. I do not feather selections. And usually when I'm at a presentation and I say that, that I'll get a second look like, wait, what did he just say? Perhaps people think they need to run to the exits. But the reason that I don't feather selections is simply that I want to save that feathering for the layer mask. We'll talk about feathering the layer mask, of course, today. But the basic notion is that when I'm working with a selection, it's not as easy to figure out exactly how much to feather by. So in this case, for example, I have a reasonably crisp edge between the landscape here, this canola field out in the Palouse, and the sky above. If I were to create a selection, and so in fact I'll switch to the quick selection tool here, and I'll just paint a quick selection across the sky, but that selection is not feathered. And I assure you that every selection needs to be feathered. So here I'm telling you these contradictory statements. I never feather selections and yet every selection needs to be feathered at least a tiny bit. Well, I'm just applying that feathering to the selection after it's no longer a selection, once it has become a layer mask. And that enables me to see the actual effect. You'll see an example of that a little bit later. But if I were to feather this selection, then I would need to go to the menu and choose select, modify, and then feather. And then I'd need to enter a number. And I don't know what number to enter. In this case, maybe, oh, two or three pixels will probably do the trick. It depends on the circumstances. It also depends on the strength of the adjustment you're applying. Well, I don't want to play a guessing game here, and so I would much rather save that feathering for later in my workflow when I can actually see what's going on in the image itself. So, just a lesson to keep in mind, even though we have the select and mask interface available for selections, I still don't feather selections. Instead, I save that feathering for the layer mask itself. The layer mask is where all the magic is really happening, and that's where I want to do most of my work. And in fact, I very often will not spend too much time even bothering trying to clean up a selection because I find it to be much easier to clean up the layer mask later. It gives me, I think, a little bit easier environment to work with, so to speak. And again, as I've mentioned, it gives me the ability to see an actual preview of the actual effect or even of an exaggerated effect. It's just an easier way to work. So create a basic selection, then you can use that as the basis of a layer mask for a targeted adjustment or a composite image, and then refine that layer mask itself using some of the techniques that I'll be talking about today, some of which are very simple. And I think for many of you, maybe not even necessarily new information, but worth being reminded of, I think, some of these basic things. I do find that many photographers 
are intimidated by the topic of layer masking because it seems so complicated. It's math and it's, you know, got all these complexities, all these different words. I've already talked about a selection. I've talked about a layer mask. You might be familiar with an alpha channel. You might know that you can save a selection. You can also duplicate a mask. You can work in quick mask mode when you're fine tuning a selection. And yet all of those things are really exactly the same. They are all just a stencil that Lightroom, <laughs> Lightroom, that Photoshop is using to identify specific areas of an image. So for this image, maybe I want to apply some adjustments to the rocks in the foreground. So maybe I created a selection of the rocks and then with that selection active, I just add an adjustment layer. And so now I have an adjustment layer with a layer mask that is based on my original selection. So now, in this case, I'm working with a curves adjustment. If I apply a curves adjustment, I can affect only, oops, only the rocks, but now I'm affecting the sky. Ooh, I didn't make the selection that I thought I made. I made a selection of the sky. I guess I thought it was gonna be a little bit easier to select the sky rather than the rocks because of all that texture in the rocks. Now in theory, I need to go back and redo it all. No, of course, I don't need to go back and start over. I can simply invert the layer mask itself. And there are a couple ways that you can do this. I wanna emphasize one of them, but first I'll show you that on the properties panel, where we're able to adjust the settings for our adjustment layer. So here I'm working with a curves adjustment, for example, I can switch to the mask settings and you'll see that there's actually an invert button at the bottom of that properties panel when I switch to the masks tab. And so I can just simply click that invert button and my layer mask, if you take a look at the thumbnail up on the layers panel, the layer mask itself was also inverted. So I'll just click that button a few times just for fun and you can see that it is flipping back and forth. It is inverting one way or the other. That's nice, that's convenient. It's a simple click of the mouse, but I also wanna emphasize something else and for a reason that is mostly focused on helping you just better understand this topic in general. And that is that without even clicking the mouse, I can also invert that layer mask. In this case, I'm using a keyboard shortcut, but I could also go to the menu and choose a command. So I can go to the image menu, followed by adjustments, and you'll find that there is an invert command. Well, this invert command could be used to invert a photographic image. In fact, that's essentially, you might say, what it is here for is so that you could make an inverted, a negative version, so to speak, of the image itself. But I'm inverting the mask because I had selected the mask. I could have gone to the image and inverted the image itself if I was going after some sort of odd creative effect, but I selected the layer mask and I can invert it. And the reason that I'm emphasizing that so much, perhaps a little too much, is that I want to reinforce that a layer mask is just an image. It's an image that consists of only black and white and maybe shades of gray. And it's not an image in the sense of a photo directly perhaps, but it is an image in the sense of being pixels. They're just being used in a fancy way. They're being used to apply a targeted adjustment. And so, Anything that you can do to your pixels, applying adjustments, applying a filter, lightening and darkening, painting, you name it. If you can manipulate pixels in Photoshop with a given tool or technique, you can also manipulate a layer mask. So if you keep in mind that a layer mask is a stencil and then try to envision what you think that mask ought to look like. So here, for example, white for the rocks, black for the sky, because I want to affect the rocks. In this case, I'm applying an adjustment for the rocks. So I want to affect the rocks, but not the sky. So I need white for the rocks and black for the sky, because in the context of a layer mask, black blocks and white reveals either the adjustment or the pixels, depending on what that mask is attached to, is connected to. There was a question previously, Terry asks about that feathering that I was talking about. And is the correct amount of feathering dependent upon the size of the image? Yes, absolutely. And so this is a good example image. If we zoom in, in fact, in terms of feathering, there is a degree of feathering on the edge. So those rocks, I assure you, 
have a very crisp edge. It's a very hard, flat surface, so to speak. Obviously, a bit of a jagged surface, but you know what I mean. It's a very crisp edge, so the transition from rock to not rock takes place essentially a molecule. It's like less than a pixel. It's a tiny, tiny little space. And yet, zooming in, you can see there's just the slightest bit of gradation on the edge of those rocks. And so even when we have a solid, crisp object, there's going to be some degree of feathering. But if I enlarge, if I make this image bigger to produce a print, for example, then that too would affect the feathering. So if somebody says to you, you know, when you have a rocky surface like this and you want to select the sky, feather by three pixels precisely, that's only based on their experience with specific images at a specific resolution. At higher resolutions, now you've got greater detail, that feathering is going to change as well. So all the more reason that I do not feather my selections and instead feather my layer masks, uh, fine-tune my layer masks <clears throat> with the techniques that we're talking about today that include feathering, among other things as well, obviously. Now, in some respects, when we talk about layer masking, I think what photographers often think about is sort of detail and, and being very careful, and certainly we'll talk about some of that today. But in other cases, it's not actually necessary to be quite as detailed as you might think. And so here, for example, if I just wanted to darken up that background a little bit and I want to blend the result, if we take a look here, you probably can't even see any indication of the fact that I have a layer mask. If I exaggerate that adjustment, then we'll start to see some issues. Let's zoom out a little bit here and see if there's any mistakes. Oh, sure enough, I missed some feathers here. So right down in this area, the feathers are being darkened when they should not be because my selection was less than perfect, but I don't worry too much about getting the selection perfect. Instead, I would work on cleaning up the layer mask itself. I just find that to be a more efficient way to work. Now, in this case, you can see I would need to paint very carefully. So, for example, I could choose my brush tool and use a really small brush and paint right into all those nooks and crannies to get that feather that was a little bit out of place included, well, in this case, excluded from the, the targeted adjustment, from that background adjustment. But the reality is that I would hopefully never apply this kind of adjustment except for this type of purpose so I could actually see my work. If I wanted to darken the background, maybe I might take it down to somewhere around there. And now, zooming in on that same feather detail, we see that it's not quite so problematic. Point being is that in many cases, I can just do some basic painting. And so in this situation, I need to make sure that I'm painting with black. So I could press the letter D on the keyboard to get my default colors and the letter X on the keyboard to switch back and forth. So D to get black and white as your colors on the color picker down at the bottom of the toolbox, and then the letter X on the keyboard to switch between foreground and background as needed. And again, black blocks white reveals. In this case, I want to block the adjustment, and so I would paint with black. So I have my foreground color set to black, and I'm ready to block the adjustment. I'll enlarge my brush just a little bit, and I can just kind of paint into this area. Now, if I start painting beyond, you'll see that I'm getting a clear indication of my sloppy painting. I could obviously use a selection with this type of situation as well, but it doesn't take much with a little bit of a soft-edged brush to clean that area up. And even at this point, I would say that this adjustment is stronger than I would really apply it. In reality, I'd probably just darken maybe down to about oh, right around there perhaps, just to kind of balance out those tonal values a little bit. So point being is that I can simply paint on the mask. I'm using the brush tool. Generally speaking, by the time I'm painting on a mask, I'm refining, and so I would tend to use a soft-edged brush. In this case, I want a soft-edged brush regardless because I am simply blending in my adjustment effect. Again, painting typically with black and white, there are some variations. You might use shades of gray, but we'll start with the basics here and paint with black or white. And then also very important to make sure that you are painting on the layer mask. If I had been working with the background image layer for some reason, and then I go and do some painting in black, now I am painting directly on the background image layer. 
That is not a good thing. I want to click. If you're not sure that a layer mask is active, click the thumbnail for the layer mask on the layers panel. That will make it active. You can see the crop corners around the edges indicating that this is the active layer or object. And now when I'm painting, I am actually painting directly on the mask so I can paint with black to block the adjustment or white to reveal. And I do tend to use an exaggerated adjustment. You can see now that I've exaggerated the effect here. I have some cleanup work to do up on the top of the head here. So I'll just paint with black there and come over to this area and paint a little more over there and over there. And again, just using a soft edge brush, it's blending a little bit. It's not perfect in the way of the shape of the layer mask, but that's also not a critical issue because it's such a subtle adjustment. So when we're working with a very subtle adjustment, we don't have to be perfectly precise down to the pixel. We can have a little bit of blending and it'll work out just fine. All right, moving right along. Every now and then you need to evaluate, well, every now and then, Every time you make a mask, I would say you need to evaluate the mask, sometimes more than others. And the key here really is to bear in mind that while you can, in many cases, get away with a less than perfect mask, in other cases it can create some problems. And the biggest frustration here is that when you have a problem that relates to a layer mask, it's very common that you don't notice that problem until you've made a nice big print. And in fact, I think the larger you intend to print an image, the less like you, likely you are to notice any problems with the mask until it's too late. In this case, looking at the image, you might not spot any problems at all with the photo. If you look a little closer, I'm sure you'll find something. It's one of the key lessons that I often talk about in terms of evaluating your images. If you want to raise your self-esteem, at least temporarily, zoom out so that you can't see any of the details in your photo. But if you really want to produce the best images possible, then you'll need to zoom in to take a closer look. And when we do, it doesn't take much, doesn't take long to notice that there are some problems up here in the sky. But what if it wasn't quite so obvious? In fact, if I zoom in on the buildings here, Everything looks great. I don't see any of those visual artifacts that would suggest that my layer mask was anything other than perfect, so we will operate under the assumption that my mask is indeed absolutely perfect. But there are a few things that we can do to evaluate the mask a little bit more. One of those is just to simply turn off the layer mask, uh, the adjustment layer, I should say, is to simply turn off the adjustment layer and turn it back on again. And then you might notice this window in the center here is getting a little bit of an odd effect when I turn off the adjustment layer versus turn it back on again, just by clicking that eyeball icon to the left of the layer to make it visible versus invisible. It can also be helpful to temporarily disable and then re-enable the layer mask itself. So holding the shift key on the keyboard, click on the thumbnail for the layer mask, in order to essentially make the layer mask disappear. So now my adjustment is affecting the entire image and then shift click again and my adjustment is only affecting areas of the photo based on the mask. And by toggling back and forth, you'll see some areas that kind of seem to flash a little bit almost, kind of like that area of the window I pointed out. And that can be a very clear indication of some problems with the layer mask. Perhaps the most valuable little tip here in terms of evaluating the mask though is to take a look at the actual full resolution layer mask. You can do that by just holding the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh while clicking on the thumbnail for the layer mask. Brace yourself when you do it because you might see something like this. Oh my goodness, I thought the layer mask was in pretty good shape and now I see it is a complete mess. There's a lot of work to be done here. Fortunately, in this case, believe it or not, this, is, this would be very, very easy to fix. But again, the point being is that we can evaluate the mask. I like to evaluate by looking directly at the mask, but of course, keep in mind, right now I can't see the rest of the image. And so I do want to use all of these different methods. Note, by the way, just as a quick note, a quick aside, we can also adjust this mask while I'm in this mask view. So I could actually, for example, paint with black to clean things up here while I'm actually looking 
at this preview of the mask. So you can see I'm already a good percentage of the way to finishing up that mask. Very, very easy to clean things up when we're working in this view. And then again, just hold the Alt or Option key on the keyboard again and click on the thumbnail for the layer mask in order to go back to your full image view. And I do like to switch back and forth from time to time in order to evaluate, get my cleanup work done, then go back and check out the image. I don't want to look exclusively at the mask itself. Sometimes I want to actually look at the image, the actual impact on the image. So I would go back and forth multiple times. Uh, so Seth was asking, why not just fix the selection? So that would relate, well, probably in this case, maybe, I'm not sure how soon after uh, opening this image or before that question was asked, so if it was this question or not, why not just clean up the selection? Why not have a perfect selection? And quite frankly, it's because I find it's often much easier. You saw here how I could paint. So if this were a selection based on maybe the magic wand tool, for example, now I've got a shift click and a few extra areas and look for tiny little flashing marching ants display versus I could then just go into the mask itself and paint directly on the mask. So I'll paint with white in this case and we'll use a hard edge brush since we have some of these other areas to contend with. And I can just do some quick painting and it, frankly, I just find it to be quicker and easier in many cases, not always, don't get me wrong. In many cases, the selection tool is very powerful and able to give me a great result quickly. In other cases, I just find it's easier to work directly on the mask. And sometimes, as we'll see a little later, there's some mixing and uh, of the techniques, mix and match these different techniques. All right, so I, there was a question, by the way, about extracting an image with uh, fine detail. We will have an example of that very, very shortly. Uh, so again, with the question about why not just fix the selection, by and large, just because I find that it's often easier to work directly on the mask, but as I mentioned, sometimes mixing and matching. So I'm going to create a quick selection here. Uh, well, no pun intended. I'm using the quick selection tool and we will create a selection. I'm going to select the sunflower here in the foreground, but actually I want the opposite. I can invert the layer mask, but I can also invert the selection. So I could go to the select menu and choose to invert my selection so that I now have selected the background rather than the flower itself. And so now if I add an adjustment layer, so I can click on the add adjustment layer button down at the bottom of the layers panel and then choose the type of adjustment that I would like to apply. In this case, I'm going to use a cliche adjustment just because it'll make it easier for us to see what's going on. So I'll choose the black and white adjustment here. And certainly I could have cleaned up the selection. So to the question earlier, moments ago, I could certainly have worked to clean up the selection itself. I'm not sure that that would have been all that much easier. Maybe it would have and maybe not, but I've got such tiny little areas, I might find it easier to work with the brush tool, for example. So if I reduce my brush size here just a little bit, and I can now paint, in this case, I want to paint with black to block that adjustment, and I can just paint along the object that I want to clean up. Could I create a selection and make that work a little bit easier? I don't know, maybe, maybe not. It depends on my skills with the selection tools, it depends on the particular image, etc. But let's give it a try if we use the quick selection tool, for example, and once again use a small brush. Let me see how it does. If I paint along the edge, well, it didn't do a great job. I'm sure that's mostly my fault for not following the lines here very well, but this is a selection that's pretty easy to clean up. I can hold the Alt key on Windows or the Option key on Macintosh in order to access the Subtract from Selection tool and then just paint into this area that I do not want to include in the selection. And a little bit more refinement along that edge and a little more up there, etc. And there's certainly other tools and techniques. Obviously, I'm just illustrating one example here, but I have a selection. Let's pretend like this is now a perfect selection of this area. Well, I want that area on my layer mask. I'll reveal the layer mask here for a moment. I want that area to be filled with black, just like the rest of the flower. Well, I can do that just by filling. So I have a selection. I can go to the edit menu and then choose fill. And in this case, I want to fill with black. So I'll choose black from the pop-up. Make sure my mode is set to normal and opacity at 
click OK, and now that area is filled with black. And with any luck, I'll deselect my selection. That gives me a good result, and I would say, sure enough, it did. And so maybe I find the magic wand tool works a little bit better in some of these areas. We'll make this a contiguous selection for the moment. And maybe add just a little more into the rest of the flower there. And I can also use keyboard shortcuts. So the Alt or Option key on the keyboard plus the Delete key will fill with the foreground color. The Control or Command key on the keyboard plus the Delete key will fill with the background color. So in this case, Alt or Option Delete fills that selection with black, and I've got a nice result. So how do we choose then? Am I going to use a selection? Am I going to clean up the selection? Am I going to paint? Am I going to make a layer mask and then paint on the layer mask versus create a selection and fill? Well, it depends, and much of this just depends on you and your personal preference. You might prefer to always work only with the selections and not create a layer mask until that selection is perfect. And if that's your preference, then that's perfectly fine. I prefer to work directly with the mask because now I can see the actual effect of my work as opposed to just hoping that it will all work out after looking at the maybe quick mask mode display or the marching ants display, the selection outline. But again, keeping in mind that really what we're doing, we're essentially drawing a picture, aren't we? I am drawing a picture of a sunflower. It's just that in this case, the sunflower will be entirely black and the background will be entirely white, but I'm just drawing a sunflower. I can create a selection and add a layer mask or add an adjustment layer which comes with a layer mask automatically. That is essentially telling Photoshop to fill based on the selection. Or I could explicitly create a selection as I did here and fill that selection. But I can also use the brush tool and the pencil tool and the clone stamp tool and any other tool you can imagine in Photoshop in order to perform that work. So I can keep looking for additional areas and either maybe I'm going to paint some of these. So in this case, I need to paint with white, get a little bit larger brush, adjusting that brush size up. Oh, I'm actually thinking backwards here. I did that on purpose though, of course, for educational reasons. I was thinking backwards that I needed to paint with white. I needed to paint with black because this is a black and white adjustment and I am blocking the adjustment from this area of the photo to reveal the original color. And so again, bearing in mind, and that's another reason that looking at the layer mask itself, by the way, can be helpful. It can help remind you of whether you need to paint with black or white because even those of us who have been doing this for a very long time sometimes get confused about which color I need right at the very moment. All right, so obviously a little bit more work to be done for that image, but I just wanted to illustrate that concept in terms of being able to get in there and paint or fill or use any other technique that you can imagine in order to produce your effect. So we talked about feathering well, we talked about not feathering a selection. Let's talk about the actual feathering that I would want to use. I'll just create a quick selection. In this case, I want to create a, a selection of the sky. And so I'll just use the quick selection tool to drag across the sky. The quick selection tool does not have a non-contiguous option. And so at any given moment, I can only create or add to a selection based on a contiguous area of the image. So this area, these are the Farioni rocks in, on the island of Capri in Italy. And there's this cool little tunnel that you can go through on a boat. And it is not included in the selection, but it should be. But again, because I'm working with the quick selection tool, I can't include discontiguous areas as part of my initial selection. Instead, I would need to add those areas. And fortunately, the quick selection tool switches to the add option, the add mode automatically once you start using it. So I can just reduce my brush size using the left square bracket key on the keyboard to reduce the size or the right square bracket to increase. And then a quick little painting in that area. And now I have my selection of the sky. Every selection must be feathered, theoretically, but in practice I don't feather the selections, instead saving that work for later in my workflow. So I have a selection. I presume it is probably pretty near perfect because the quick selection tool is so amazing. I'll go ahead and click the Add Adjustment Layer button at the bottom of the Layers panel, and I will choose, in this case, let's assume I want some more drama in the sky, so I'll use a Curves Adjustment. 
and I typically would apply at least initially an exaggerated adjustment to get a better sense of exactly what I need to do in terms of cleaning up my mask. And then let's just focus our attention on the rocks. Again, we saw this earlier, some rocks that had a very crisp edge, and yet I need a little bit of blending. The adjustment is affecting the rocks just a little bit. In theory, that means my selection was less than perfect. I probably got some areas where the sky is not being affected and very often I can fix this sort of issue with a very simple feathering. If we take a look at the layer mask itself you'll see that it's a relatively crisp edge and what I want to do is blur it a little bit. I want to add a little bit of feathering so that we get some transition along that edge. How much? Just the right amount. Not too much, not too little. You saw the initial image that was obviously too little feathering, especially since it was none. You can probably already appreciate that this is too much feathering. So uh, sure enough, we see a little bit of a glow type of effect out over here, a little bit of that glow, that halo, and that's just because the adjustment is not affecting the image in the correct areas. So going back to the image here, no feathering, then a little bit of feathering and a little bit more and a little bit more. If we go too far, it might be a good thing, frankly, because then we blended it so much that we can't see any indication of our work, except that now I'm darkening up the rock faces here and I didn't really want to do that. You can see the transition along the right edge here, for example. I'll go ahead and reveal the mask and you can see that I'm really blending very heavily. Now, in some cases, that might be exactly what you need a very strong degree of feathering so that you can blend away. So if I go to a moderately high setting here, if you take a look, especially at the edges, the gap in between the two rocks, you see that high degree of a halo effect because I feathered too much. But once I push it even further, now I've gotten so much blending, there's no evidence per se of my work other than a photographer would look at this image now and say, boy, that was some odd lighting effects that you had on the rocks. So we want just the right amount, and that usually means a moderately low amount. It also usually means that that is combined with a not too exaggerated adjustment. You can see this curves adjustment is wildly exaggerated. So maybe something more like this. Maybe I even want to brighten up the highlights just a little bit. Take this down just a little bit more. Maybe something like that. I might want to shift the color and you know perform a variety of other adjustments here, for example. Things are looking a bit too cyan in the sky. Right about there looks a little bit better. Obviously, I could continue fine-tuning, but the point here is the layer mask itself and applying just that very basic feathering. So if you are fortunate enough to have a great selection as your starting point, it might have been an easy scenario. And I encourage photographing subjects that, that lend themselves to easy selections. But if you do have a selection that's not that difficult to create, and you're applying a relatively modest adjustment, then you might not need anything more than just a little bit of feathering to blend the edges between the areas you're adjusting versus the areas that you're not adjusting. Moving right along, my least favorite topic of the entire presentation today, and perhaps your least favorite too, at least if you ever have to perform this work, I'll just make a quick selection with the quick selection tool and we'll assume that I want to apply an adjustment to the sky, add a little bit of drama. Let's pretend like this is actually a good adjustment. If I zoom in, you'll see that the effect is not so good. Obviously the effect in the sky is exaggerated, but let's pretend like that's a good adjustment. It's strong, but let's assume it was a good adjustment, that we're happy with it. But now we see that my work in the image down below is not so good. Now I'm going to show you a few other things that we can do to help clean up this type of mask. So rest assured there might be some options for improving the mask, but before we get to those things, I want to make it clear that sometimes a good layer mask involves manual labor. It involves time. It involves getting down to the pixel level and cleaning things up. And so maybe I need to use the brush tool, for example, a really small brush, paint with black in this case, and block the adjustment for the tree. And there are situations. I have learned a lot of magic tricks in Photoshop over the years. 
I can get myself out of a lot of messes in Photoshop. I've gotten myself into a lot of messes with Photoshop and I can often get myself out, but when it comes to perfecting a layer mask, there are situations where I just need to get down to the pixel level and paint pixel by pixel to paint with white to add the adjustment in certain areas, maybe to tone down some of the sky. Uh, in this case, little areas of sky that are blown out in between the trees, and so I can darken those down by painting with white to reveal the adjustment in those areas, and then painting with black to get rid of these you know, burnt tips on the trees here, cleaning up, going pixel by pixel. It's not the most fun you'll ever have in Photoshop. Uh, it might lead you to hire an intern of some sort so that you can let somebody else do the work for you. But the point is that there are situations where we simply need to get in there and paint pixel by pixel to clean things up. I try to avoid those circumstances as much as possible, but those circumstances do indeed exist. So let's try not to think about that too much and let's move on to some other situations, some other images, some techniques that we can actually use to hopefully avoid all of that painting. And a few tricks that we're going to take a look at that the, I think the key challenge to the techniques I'm going to show you here is identifying when to use which technique. So a lot of this is just a matter of remembering that these options exist and then it's applying them appropriately with a given image. So here for example I have a targeted adjustment. I thought I did a pretty good job making a selection. Let's see how I did. No I didn't. I did a horrible job making a selection, but I'm sure I did that on purpose in order to help teach you a lesson about another cool technique that you could do, use in Photoshop to help improve your layer masks. And this is one, this goes back a long way, this, this adjustment, this filter actually, because it was originally intended, as the name implies, it's a dust and scratches filter for liter literally eliminating dust and scratches. Scratches? How would you get a scratch on a digital photo? Well, ladies and gentlemen, this filter goes way back to the days of film photography. And when you would scan a slide or even scan a print, you might have some dust on the surface of it and some scratches. And this filter is aimed at cleaning that up. And I realize that's a lot, an awful lot of what this looks like, kind of dust and scratches. I've got the black exterior outside of the window shutters and then the white area, or at least what should be white for the shutters because I'm applying an adjustment for just those window shutters, but obviously the mask is far from ideal. We'll go ahead, in fact I'll leave the image visible so that we can see some of the effect in the background, and let's make this adjustment a little bit silly just so that we can see more readily just how bad that mask is, and so I'll zoom in on one of these shutters right like that should work pretty well, so that you can see that there are areas of the shutter that are not being affected. Hopefully I did not actually intend to make these, uh, what would you call that, violet shutters rather than the nice blue that they were, but just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to click on the layer mask to make sure it is active. Remember, we can use any tool or technique in Photoshop that lets you manipulate pixels in an image and use that technique to manipulate pixels on the layer mask itself. So you want to make sure that you're on the layer mask when you're going to use one of those techniques. Simply click on the thumbnail for the layer mask to make sure it is active. And then I'll go to the filter menu and under noise we can find dust and scratches. I'll bring up the dust and scratches filter and let's pan into the white area here. I'll go ahead and reduce the values for radius and threshold so that we can see the impact of each. So radius is size and essentially what we're doing is identifying the size of the dust spots or the scratches. How thick are those scratches? And I can increase the value and you'll notice as I increase the value and as the preview updates you'll see that we're getting larger and larger areas. So we start with just a fine detail and then we go into the larger and larger and larger dust spots and scratches in theory, but in this case, of course, just errors in the original selection. Let me pan over to the side so we can see the edges. So I've essentially removed all of those areas, those blemishes in the layer mask, but I've also lost some of the edge detail, so I can bring up the threshold to require a little bit more difference between those values before we clean things up. 
And so we'll bring that up just enough, maybe right about there. And we'll pan around, of course, and make sure that we don't have any areas that are still problematic. That looks to be pretty good in terms of an outline for the area that I'm trying to apply my adjustment to. I'll go ahead and click OK. And you can see that I've got a much improved result. You can also maybe notice that I have a few little areas along the edges that are less than perfect that I would want to clean up. But in terms of that really messy effect in the central area of the shutters here, I have fixed that so that I'm getting a uniform adjustment throughout the shutters themselves. Maybe a little bit more cleanup to do around the edges, but a quick and easy way to apply that cleanup when you have a lot of those little specks and spots and you know what if essentially mimic dust and scratches on your layer mask so that dust and scratches filter can be quite helpful in those types of situations it is also possible to use a color range command you're probably already familiar with the color range command for creating a selection but you can also use a color range command to refine a layer mask just a little bit so in this case, let's go ahead and apply an exaggerated adjustment so you can see the trees in the foreground are being affected, but we're also getting an impact. In fact, I'll leave this exaggerated adjustment. We're getting an impact on the glacier that's back behind the trees there. And so that's obviously a problem. And it's because if we reveal that layer mask, it's because that layer mask is far from ideal. So, how are we going to fix that? Well, I'll reveal the image again. With the layer mask active, going to the Properties panel, the Masks tab, if you will, I can go to the Color Range command. And this is interesting. It's not the Color Range, well, it is the Color Range command that you know and love, but it's not operating quite the same way. I'll go ahead and sample out into the tree area, and then I will click the plus and add into the tree. Now, if you notice the preview that I'm getting in the actual dialog here, let me make sure I'm sampling some of these other areas of tree, and hopefully, man, let me take that last step back just a little bit. Right there looks to be pretty good. So you'll notice that I'm sampling and I'm ending up with what appears to be a mask that will be wildly different. So let's just call that a white mask with a diagonal black stripe going through it. That's what we think we're going to end up with. I click OK, however, and it's not what I end up with. Instead, I end up with a layer mask that is much closer to what I actually wanted to achieve for this image. And so it can be a little bit misleading when you're working with the color range command in this way in that it seemed like I was getting a bad result. You might have said, well, this obviously is not working cancel and try to find some other technique but give it a shot because when you're working with color range in the context of a layer mask like this you actually are modifying the mask as opposed to completely replacing it in this case that's done a pretty good job i probably could have fine-tuned my sampling of the image a little bit more and gotten an even better result but i could also do some quick painting with white to clean things up and then Again, if my adjustment, obviously in this case that adjustment was a bit ridiculous, if it was not going to be quite so exaggerated, I probably don't even need to worry too much, but I certainly don't want to have the effect completely altering the ice of the glacier that appears, especially down in here where we've got a lot more visibility to that glacier, I don't want the adjustment to affect. So that color range modification for a layer mask I find can be tremendously valuable. And then this, arguably, my favorite technique of all uh, in terms of cleaning up a layer mask. There was a question earlier about uh, fine detail. I think the specific question related to like a macro shot of flowers where you have, you know, feather, a feathery detail. You know, what would you, I don't know the technical name, but I'm not a botanist, clearly. But <laughs> the, the fuzzies that you get on the stem of a flower, for example, um, or even, you know, on the, the various components and on the petals in some cases, depending on the flower. But whenever you have this sort of fuzzy detail, creating a good layer mask can be a challenge. So I'm going to refresh for you. I know many of you probably are familiar with the channel-based selection technique. I'm going to remind you of that real quickly here and then show you how we can actually dodge and burn on a layer mask to help clean up that mask while preserving as much detail as possible. So we're going to start off with our channel-based selection technique, and that involves 
going to the channels panel anytime you have some color contrast in the image but maybe not the best luminance contrast or you just can't get a good selection otherwise the channel based technique actually can work very nicely we go to the channels panel if you don't have your channels panel visible you can go to the window menu and choose channels and then we want to click on the thumbnail for each of the color bearing channels in turn so the red channel the green channel the blue channel and all we're doing by clicking is making that particular channel the only channel that we're looking at and we want to find the channel with the best overall contrast in other words, which channel looks the closest to the layer mask that we ultimately want to create. And in this case, obviously, it's the blue channel. We might have assumed that the green channel was going to work well because of that green background, but actually there's not much in the way of contrast there. So we'll opt for blue. So I'll use this blue channel as the starting point of my layer mask. I'll just drag that blue channel down to the Create a New Channel button, the blank sheet of paper icon at the bottom of the Channels panel. Just a drag and drop, that will create a blue copy, a duplicate of my blue channel. So now I can alter this channel without altering the color. So the red, green, and blue channels, those are our color-bearing channels. Anything extra? is an alpha channel. So you've heard about selections and quick mask mode and layer masks and alpha channels. Well, an alpha channel is just a channel that is not a color bearing channel. And in fact, really all of this is how Photoshop is thinking about selections and layer masks in the background. You might not see the channel at all times, but it really is there in the background. Again, just a black and white image. But this image has got too many shades of gray. I need more contrast to get closer to that black versus white mask for my final result. So in this case, I'll go to the image menu and choose adjustments followed by levels. I could also use a keyboard shortcut, obviously. And what I want to do is bring the white point in until the macaque here gets perfectly white. And I want to bring the black point in until the background gets perfectly black and you can see it's impossible. I just cannot achieve the actual intended result because I've got these shades of values, some of the lighter areas in the background, some of the darker areas in the macaque, and so I'm going to have to compromise just a little bit, so maybe bringing the black point to right about there, and the white point maybe right about there. And what I'm doing is trying to maximize contrast without sacrificing too much of that fur detail. If I go too far, then I'll start to lose some of the fur detail. And what I'm really paying attention to is the edge, the transition of the object. So the edge of the macaque here. The interior, I'm not too worried about. The exterior, I'm not too worried about. I'm just concerned about the outline of my subject. And for this image, I actually would focus exclusively on the macaque itself. I wouldn't worry, for example, about the stump that he's sitting on because I can clean that up pretty easily later. I'm just focused on the real challenge at the moment. And so that looks to be a pretty good result overall. Well, I'll click OK and <laughs> you can probably appreciate this is not a good result overall. It seems like I've barely gotten started, but actually we can clean this up pretty quickly. So I'm going to start off with the dodging and burning technique. I'll choose my brush tool from the toolbox and then I'm going to change the blend mode on the options bar here. I want to use the overlay blend mode. You might be familiar with the dodging and burning technique. It involves a separate layer with the brush tool with that layer set to the overlay blend mode. Well, we can do the same basic thing with our brush working directly on a layer mask. First though, let me show you what happens if you don't use that overlay blend mode. We'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit here. I start off out here, I'm gonna paint with black, so I'll set my colors to the defaults and press X to switch to black. If I paint out here, oh brilliant, it's working wonderfully. What a, an amazing technique this is. Obviously this is going to give us exactly what we need to clean things up perfectly until we get too close to the macaque. And that is because we're just painting with black, obliterating everything in our path. If I switch to the overlay blend mode instead, now I'm dodging and burning. So I can paint over areas and still get rid of them. But if I paint over a pure white area, I'll go ahead and try to darken up the interior of the macaque here. The black areas or the gray areas are turning black but the white areas are unaffected and so 
I'm still able to destroy detail with this technique. Any shades of gray can be obliterated, but now I don't have to be as careful because I'm essentially then just giving this macaque a tiny bit of a haircut, but really I'm just cleaning up the background. So I might get rid of just a tiny bit of the fur detail that is shades of gray along those edges. Do I have anything else to clean up along the outside? It doesn't look like it. Uh, maybe a tiny little bit over here. So I could still give him a little bit of a haircut, but I'm not too terribly worried about that because I'm preserving the vast majority of that detail. So that takes care of the outer area. Not entirely, but I'll fix that in a moment. Now I'm going to fix or clean up the interior area. So I'll switch my color to white and I'm painting with this dodging and burning, with the overlay technique, it might require a few clicks of the mouse, a few additional brush strokes essentially, to get some of those darker areas to lighten up until they've shifted to pure white. You may also find, as you can see here, there are some areas that are pure black already and they are not going to be affected. So black and white are not impacted by this technique. It's only the shades of gray in between that are being altered by my brushing. And notice that I'm not painting into the full interior of the macaque. All I'm doing is creating a little path for myself along the outer edges. And again, I'm not worried about that bottom area. I'll just clean that up with some other technique later. I can then choose one of my selection tools. I'll use the polygonal, the polygonal lasso tool in this case, and just create a selection just inside the outer edge of the macaque. So again, I was creating that path for myself so that I could create this selection relatively quickly and easily. And close that selection with a double click. And now I can fill that interior area, holding the Alter Option key and pressing the Delete key fills with white. Again, conveniently ignoring the area down below that I'll clean up later, but I have a pretty good starting point here. I'll zoom out a little bit and I'm going to make another selection. I'll just go around the edge of the macaque, staying inside any of those blemishes that I need to clean up, but otherwise just tracing roughly around the outer edge of the macaque and then going outside of the actual image area so that I can create a selection of just that outer portion of the image. My background color is currently black, so I could hold the control or command key on the keyboard and press delete on the keyboard to fill with that color, with the background color in this case, and then a control or command D to deselect. And then finally, I have, for the most part, a good starting point for this macaque layer mask. I need a selection to use as the basis of that. So with my blue copy active on the layers panel, I can just click this dashed circle icon, the button down at the bottom of the channels panel. That is load channel as selection. It will create a selection where white areas of the mask are selected, black areas are not selected, and shades of gray are partially selected. And you can see that that has given me a very good starting point for that selection. In fact, let's go ahead and switch to the layers panel and we'll apply an adjustment to the background and you'll see that we can apply to the foreground, I mean, did I say background? I meant foreground. <laughs> I'll invert that layer mask very quickly before anyone notices and then I can apply that adjustment while still preserving that detail, that uh, fur detail for the macaque itself. So dodging and burning, again, the channel selection technique is great all on its own, but then dodging and burning on that result to help clean things up can be just incredibly valuable, especially for the fuzzy stuff. When you've got hair, feathers, and fur, and any of those fuzzy details, that technique can be just an absolute lifesaver. All right, last but not least, this one is pretty straightforward. I'm sure many of you have already seen some of these capabilities. Recently, Adobe updated Photoshop to change the behavior and how you access the uh, what the selected mask or the refined mask capabilities. Let's go ahead and just start with a selection using the magic wand tool here. Just click into the sky. Oh, I had my contiguous option turned on earlier, so I'll turn that off and then shift click in a couple of other areas and it looks like we have ourselves a good starting point for a selection of the sky. I'll then add an adjustment layer. We'll just go to the ever-present curves adjustment, and we have an adjustment that is affecting the sky, but not our lilac-breasted roller here. And as we talked about earlier, if you zoom out, everything seems just wonderful. If you zoom out far enough, the image looks absolutely great. 
but when we take a closer look we start to realize that there are some problems. So let's start off with a simple problem here. Feathering. No pun intended whatsoever. If I go to my masks settings here on the properties panel, feathering usually works so great with birds and yet I'm getting a problematic halo along that edge. So obviously not a good result. I'll just take that feathering back down to zero and rest assured that there are other techniques that we can use. There is actually a select and mask button on the properties panel, but also there's a setting in preferences that you can enable so that you can simply double click on a layer mask to switch into this select and mask mode, this refine mask mode. And this, I think there's a big improvement. Instead of using a dialog, now I'm working directly on the image. Uh, speaking of which, I do recommend on your view pop-up that you set the option to on layers so that you're seeing the actual effect in the actual image. So first off, let's take a look at that feathering control because it's really not as bad as we thought it was. I don't need much in the way of feathering. I'll exaggerate a little bit and then take it down. This is still too much, but I'm going to leave that exaggerated so you can see a little more clearly what's going to happen when we shift the edge. So the issue here is not so much that the feathering is too much and causing a halo. It, I mean, it probably is a little too much, but the halo is really caused by that transition not being in the right place in addition to the size. Well, shift edge enables me to shift that edge, that layer mask edge, inward or outward. So I can adjust the position, essentially. So I might shift it inward a little bit, maybe reduce that feathering just a little bit, and somewhere around there looks to be pretty good until we take a closer look at another area of the photo and find our problematic, the, uh, I don't know what you would officially call those, I refer to these as chin feathers, and we've got this very rough transition there. Now in concept we can use the edge detection setting here so I can increase the value for radius and turn on smart radius so that it will get more fuzzy for fuzzy areas, etc. And you'll notice a little bit of a transition as I apply that refinement to the settings, but not really giving us quite what we need. In theory you might play with smooth sometimes, but not all that often and not too much. Smooth will actually smooth out the rough edges but it also means that that mask is not following along the detail very well. Contrast, by the way, is just the opposite of feathering. So if you decide your feathering was too much, you could increase contrast. Well, I would actually then just reduce the value for feather. But in any event, you can see that those various adjustments are improving our result, but we still have this problem area in the middle, and that is where our refinement brush comes into play. So we have a set of brushes here. We can actually create a selection. So for example, as you saw earlier, if we want to fill based on a selection, we can directly paint as though we were out painting on the layer mask itself on the layers panel, or this refinement, which is sort of this intelligent cleanup brush. And so when I have an area like this, I can paint with this brush, and you'll notice I'm getting a little darkening preview, and then when I release the mouse, we'll get some more blending in those areas. I can actually switch to a subtract option if I wanted to as well. So for example, to subtract some of that area from the adjustment effect. But in this case, I do want that plus control to blend in those areas. So again, just refining things, painting out into those edge areas. I obviously could, well not obviously necessarily, but I could certainly refine my overall radius. In this case that was a little bit too exaggerated and then paint some more as needed to try to improve that result. Bearing in mind, by the way, you can see this is a ridiculous degree of adjustment for the image. I'm adding some vignetting at the corners or, well, revealing the vignetting by darkening up so much. The sky looks just uh, silly, quite frankly. So bearing in mind that I'm scrutinizing my layer mask but with a very exaggerated adjustment. When I think I'm pretty close, bearing in mind I could always return to this mask option if need be, it's worthwhile to go revisit with a more appropriate adjustment. Even this would be a little bit strong in terms of darkening the sky, but you can see that now my cleanup work on that mask is really proving to be very helpful. So I can apply a relatively strong adjustment and still get a good result thanks to just that refinement. So sometimes you're going to need to paint directly on the mask. Sometimes you're going to be able to use some of those other tricks like the dodging and burning, this refined mask capability, mixing and matching. But I think the most important thing is to 
try to maintain an awareness of what is available in terms of these different tools and techniques. And then bearing in mind what is available, then when you run into various situations, trying to make uh, decisions about what technique might work best. So, uh, see, so Stephen asks if there was any difference but with uh, quick mask selection. So, uh, referencing essentially some of the various techniques working directly on the mask, we can indeed use quick mask mode. I made reference to quick mask mode, but we didn't actually talk about it in the context of mask cleanup. So quick mask mode is a way to modify the original selection. So with a selection active, I can press the letter Q on the keyboard to enter quick mask mode. And I can also then, if I want to, I can change the settings. So down at the bottom of my toolbar, which is just barely visible here, I can get to the quick mask button, double click, and I can change the color of my quick mask. So if there was a lot of red in the photo, for example, I might want to use a different color value. But when I'm in quick mask mode, I can actually see the fuzziness. So I'll actually just make some silly brush strokes here so that you can see. Oops, I'm working. Let me go back to a different, there we go. So I'm working directly on my selection here. And if I were to paint in some additional areas, in fact, let me switch to a simpler image and we'll make a quick selection here. And now as I'm painting, oops, with my not brush tool, as I'm painting in order to add or subtract areas to or from the selection. I don't know why this isn't being revealed, but in any event, the point being is that we can see the actual shape as you, as it were of that quick mask. So in fact, if we were to then feather, we would see the actual feathering effect. We would see that blending here with quick mask. So in some respects, working in quick mask mode eliminates my concerns about working with a selection versus a layer mask, but what quick mask mode is still lacking is the ability to see the actual effect in the actual image while you're working. You're getting a better preview of your selection, but still not ideal, I would say. Ah, so a good question, Jan, uh, related to curves. So I'll just add a curves adjustment here. And she was noticing that if I'm adjusting the curve here, sometimes you can see the layer mask is active and sometimes the actual curve layer is active. And so what's going on? Well, it's just that really what's happening is when I switch between the adjustment layer and the layer mask on the layers panel, what I'm really doing is switching between the adjustment layer settings versus the mask settings on the properties panel. In actual fact, even with the layer mask active, you can switch to your adjustment layer settings on the layers panel, uh, sorry, on the properties panel in order to refine. So in this case, I'm not actually refining. I can't use an adjustment layer to refine a layer mask. If I wanted to use an adjustment to affect a mask, I would have to apply a direct adjustment. So for example, a levels adjustment directly on the layer mask itself. Ah, so a good question, George, how do you add to a selection without messing up the current selection? So if we have a selection active, then we can use an add to selection. So without messing up the selection, well, that depends on what you mean by messing up. If I wanted to expand the selection without losing access to this existing selection, I would want to do one of two things. Either save the selection or use this selection as a layer mask, which then, could, then it could be loaded as a further layer mask. So I could mix and match if I had you know, multiple areas of the image that I wanted to adjust in different ways, I could mix and match these various techniques. And so, uh, for example, if we have a selection active and I wanted to expand a little bit into other areas of the photo, then I could first save the selection. So call this uh, full sky, for example. And then maybe I wanted to add, you know, just for the background a little bit, if I'm adding uh, to this selection. So if I go to my quick mask. Uh, actually, I'm going to switch to my uh, 
quick selection tool and if I wanted to add this background area which obviously will get most of that top area for whatever silly reason this just happens to be the image that is open at the moment then I could save that selection as well we'll call this you know sky plus some hill you know whatever the case might be a silly example in this case obviously but then I always have the ability to get back to that original selection uh, so in this case the actual selection that I saved was full sky and so I can replace by choosing the new selection option and I'm back. So I can certainly expand upon the selection, but I can save that selection along the way. And similarly, if I needed, let's just assume that I wanted, uh, oh, maybe an adjustment. In fact, I'll deselect maybe an adjustment that affects the image in a gradient fashion. So if I were to add a gradient to the image, something like this as a layer mask, and I want to get back to the original, I can just control click on Windows Command click on Macintosh on the thumbnail for the layer mask to load a selection. So in some cases, you might want to save a selection to use that saved selection as building blocks for additional work. More often than not, I don't save selections because I don't need to. I actually have saved the selection by virtue of using the selection as the basis of a layer mask because I can always load that layer mask as a selection. Terry asked if I can do a webinar on luminosity masks. Yes, we did cover one example of luminosity masks uh, in one of the previous webinars related to selections, but yes, I will put that on my list for a future uh, webinar presentation. And then one last question. I, we've got some other questions here. I'll try to get to some of these as follow-up questions. Do feel free to email me as well if I don't get to your question and you're uh, still wanting to get some of those addressed, but we are running over time. Uh, but how do you duplicate and or save? So we talked about saving, and here's how I can duplicate, but I want to point out one additional thing here. I'm going to throw away this uh, uh, gradient adjustment that I didn't really need. I can create, I can duplicate a mask by holding the control key on Windows, command key on Macintosh, while clicking on the thumbnail for the mask to load a selection based on the mask. Then I could add another adjustment. So let's just say, oh, I don't know, hue saturation for whatever reason. And now I have a duplicate mask. However... Generally speaking, I would not do that because I don't want to have to clean up multiple masks if I discovered there was a problem. So instead, I'll get rid of the hue saturation adjustment here, when I reach that point that I realize I want to affect one area with multiple adjustments, then I could load, or if I knew this in advance, I could jump directly to this, but I could load the layer mask as a selection, then add a layer group with the little folder icon down at the bottom of the layers panel, add a layer mask to that layer group with the circle inside of a rectangle icon, again at the bottom of the layer, uh, layers panel. And now I have a layer group with a layer mask. So I could discard my curves adjustment layer mask, just drag it to the trash can and delete it. Now my adjustment is affecting the entire image, but if I put my curves adjustment inside the layer group, now that curves adjustment is being constrained based on the mask for the group. If I add another adjustment, oh, well, that's a black and white area by and large, but let's just assume that saturation, we'll get some color out of there, not good color, but color any, anyway. And so we can get multiple adjustments affecting a single area of the image by using a layer group with a layer mask and then putting as many adjustment layers inside the layer group as we need. All right, that has been a lot of information, wasn't it? I'm tired. Are you tired? Probably. I want to thank you all once again for joining me today. And thanks again to Tamron for sponsoring today's webinar presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. This has been a lot of my favorite techniques as they relate to cleaning up layer masks in Photoshop for targeted adjustments. If you want to explore further, we have a course in Gray Learning on selections, one on targeted adjustments, one on creating composite images. All of those are included in a bundle, the Photoshop for Photographers bundle available in Gray Learning, and you can get it for $50 off, just $99 using the link that you see here, timgray.me slash webinar 99PS for a $99 price on the full bundle. It, I don't even remember now. I think it's something, it's more than a dozen hours of educational content and we keep adding new content to it all the time. But again, thank you very much for joining me today. I'll look forward to seeing you on a future webinar presentation. And if you do have other suggestions for topics, email those into us as well. You can reach me at tim at timgray.com. 
and I'd be happy to put those on the list for a future webinar as part of the Gray Learning webinar series. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next time.